My company is Catch a Fire, as Sam said, an online platform that connects social good organizations to professionals who are giving their time and their skills pro bono. Today I'm going to talk about motivation um, and the relationship between motivation and doing good. Uh, um, it's, if I could get my text up, it's an interesting thing that we think often that doing good um, and having good intentions um, go hand in hand, meaning that we often think that good intentions lead to actual good impact. Um, and that's obviously false. So let's just put that out on the table first. Um, an example of this um, was having a little bit of issue here. Um, an example of this was when I graduated college, um, I went, probably like many of you, um, I went to Tanzania um, for three months to volunteer my skills, um, my time and my skills. And those skills that I was volunteering at the time were my art skills. Um, and I was going to Tanzania to help um, teach art to students who needed a vocational skill in order to earn an income. Um, I'd never taught art before, um, and I was there just trying my best, um, not sure of what impact I was making. And when I came back to um, the United States, everybody was saying to me, wow, you're such a good person for volunteering. Um, and, and it really sparked the question in my mind, what makes me a good person for just wanting to go to Africa to really just see the country and at the same time give back? Um, so, you know, this question of why is it that good intention, why do we equate good intention with actual, with actual good work, I think is a very important one. I think the important questions um, for us to ask are why do we reward <coughs> intention? Um, instead, I think the questions we should be asking are what did you do that made a difference? What was your impact? How did you go about making that impact? How do you know you made that impact? And how do you measure this impact? Um, if we focus on just the good intention um, and rewarding that good intention, um, I don't think it's only misplaced, but I actually think it's detrimental. And the reason why I think that's detrimental is because it distracts us from focusing on how to actually make that impact. And that is what's more important than just feeling good about the fact that we had a good intention. So my point is that motivation is a means to an end, not the end itself. Um, instead, what I think we should foco focus on, um, how many of you in here um, are entrepreneurs? Great, so, so you focus on this, right? You focus on how to get shit done. Um, and I think this is really important, um, especially for you know just regular entrepreneurs. And I think that social entrepreneurs are also regular entrepreneurs. But w we always have to focus on actually how to get the thing done that we're trying to get done. But I think that something that's distracting for social good organizations is this problem of thinking that just having the good intent leads to the good outcome. So instead, let's focus on how to actually get shit done, um, and let's think about how, from the social good perspective, how to motivate behavior so that you're actually getting what it is you want done based on how you incentivize behavior. So we know that people are motivated by a bunch of different things, um, and that's great. Um, it's, it's interesting because my site is a volunteer matching site, and, and I think that the, the number one thing that people think when they think about somebody who's volunteering is the motivation to just do good. 
um, or to be altruistic, as opposed to thinking about the many other motivations that, in fact, may be even stronger than this desire to be altruistic or to do good. Um, and my argument is that the motivation um, is not what's important. Like, we shouldn't be focused on, you know, okay, this person decided to volunteer, you know, 10 hours of their time because they wanted to meet a date. This person volunteered, you know, three months in Africa because they wanted to see the country. Um, it doesn't make that good action any less because of the motivation. It, and in fact, it's very powerful then to think about the motivation as a way to incentivize behavior. So let's be smart and incentivize the behavior we want in order to create positive social change. So I'm going to take you through um, a few examples of social good companies that I think do a really good job of this. The first one is the Robin Hood Foundation. How many of you know the Robin Hood Foundation? OK, great. So the Robin Hood Foundation is a foundation based in New York City. It's focused on alleviating poverty in New York. So one in five New York City residents um, live in poverty. And the entire mission of the Robin Hood Foundation is to alleviate this. Um, last year, in terms of their impact, Robin Hood sheltered over 5,000 people, helped 45,000 New York City students get a first class education, provided over 5 million meals, helped over 35,000 receive health care, provided support for over 8,700 families with young children, helped 6,000 people find and keep work, and provided more than 400,000 people with counseling services. So my point is that they make a lot of impact. And how do they, how do, they do this? Well, um, they raised almost $48 million in one night. Um, and that's interesting, right? So I, I'm not saying for the year. I'm saying in one night. Um, and they did this um, by putting on their annual gala. This is a really big deal in New York. It's one of the hottest events of the year where um, the celebrities go, um, the big hedge fund people go and buy tables um, f for about $10,000 a head. It's, it's a big to-do. Um, and what's powerful about this event, um, and to the, to, to the point of motivation, is that Robin Hood has really taken advantage of the psychology that people want status and recognition. So they put on this big gala, they have celebrities come, and then they have um, hedge, fund, um, hedge fund people um, bid on really big ticket items. So for instance, one of my friends um, paid $500,000 um, to perform at Madison Square Garden with the Black Eyed Peas. Um, and so these are the type of ticket items that celebrities donate and big hedge fund guys um, bid on. Um, and, and, it's a, and if you can imagine, it's, it's a very public sort of room and it's an auction situation so that when you're actually bidding, you know, a million dollars to, I don't know, play baseball with um, Derek Jeter, everybody knows that you've done that. And everybody knows that you've been contributing a million dollars to the Robin Hood Foundation. So they've really taken advantage of this idea that people want status and recognition. Because I bet that that hedge fund person probably wouldn't have given, written, you know, sitting at his desk, written a check for a million dollars. He needed that setting. Um, so I think that's very smart of the Robin Hood Foundation. And the point is that at the end of the day, it does good, right? It goes to um, the children and the, um, the beneficiaries in New York City that Robin Hood serves. And not, another example, which I'm sure many of you know of, is Tom's Shoes. Um, Tom's Shoes, I would argue, is um, probably a for-profit organization before it is a social good organization. but social good is definitely part of its DNA. Um, and I would argue that Tom Shoes, even though it's a for-profit company, um, like Catchafire, but, but different in the sense that for-profit comes first, um, is that, um, that they probably do more social good than many nonprofits, um, even though they're 
first motivation is, is profit. Um, and how do they do this? And, and what is their model? Well, Tom Shoes um, believes that shoes, as well as um, education um, and sanitation, are really important to providing children in the developing world with opportunity. Um, if kids don't have shoes, um, they can't go to school, they are subject to a lot of different infections, um, it's just a better thing to have shoes. Um, and so they brilliantly have um, contributed, um, and this was a, a pretty old statistic from September of last year, um, a million shoes to children in the developing world. And how did they do this? Um, well, the, what they're understanding um, is the motivation or that psychology that they're understanding is that people don't want to feel guilty. Um, and what I mean by this is that um, how many shoes do we own and why do we need another pair of shoes? We really don't. Um, so if Tom's allows us to not think about buying that pair of shoes and feeling guilty that we've bought that pair of shoes, but instead makes us think, okay, I've bought that pair of shoes and I'm doing good, how many more shoes is Tom's going to sell? A bunch more shoes. Um, and so they came up with this brilliant one-for-one -one marketing model where when somebody buys a pair of Tom shoes, um, a pair of Tom shoes is donated to a child um, in need in the developing world. Um, so I think that's a brilliant way to not only build a very big business, but also to give back and do good. They're brilliant at marketing, is the point. Um, third example is Tesla. Um, the founder of Tesla, his name's Elon Musk, and um, he's um, a big environmentalist. He wants to move um, us from a um, mine and burn hydrocarbon economy to a solar electric economy. And he's doing this um, by cre creating and designing this very sweet looking car. Um, and, and what's important about Tesla is that the, the psychology that they're really getting at is, again, the idea that people want status and recognition. So they're building and they've designed not only, you know, a 100% electric car, like truly electric car, but this car um, looks um, better than probably any other sport, sports car on the market. Um, it's designed, it has the Lotus body, um, and um, it's just, you know, it's just above and beyond when it comes to the design aspect. So it really helps that, you know, person who can um, <laughs> dish out a hundred and hundred plus thousand dollars for a car um, look really cool when they're driving this around town. Um, are there any in Boston? Any Teslas in Boston? Have you seen them? Yeah. Okay, there you go. Um, and they make a statement, right? That's the point. Um, and uh, my fourth example is Kiva. Kiva is an amazing organization um, whose mission is to help alleviate poverty through small loans. Um, they provide safe and affordable access to capital to those in need um, to help people create better lives from them, for themselves and their families. Since 2005, um, almost 650,000 people have lent through Kiva. Um, almost $260 million has been lent through this platform, um, and they have a repayment rate of nearly 99%. Um, that's really significant when you think about the fact that um, millions of people in the developing world before Kiva were not able to access credit. And without credit, um, it's a very hard thing to imagine, but without credit, how can you actually do anything? Um, you can't, you don't have the capital to start, you know, a small business. You don't have the capital potentially to, you know, go to school. Um, it's, it's a very, you know, significant problem. And Kiva has unlocked $260 million in capital for the developing world. And how did they do this? Um, well, they thought about this, that people are lazy. Um, and, you know, this is just like 
normal human nature, but let's think about like the Kiva model and why this is the underpinning. Well, with Kiva, you can lend as little as $25. You can do it on this platform. Um, you know exactly who it goes to, and you get your money back. So, I mean, how much easier is Kiva making it for people? It's as simple as it possibly can be. Um, my fifth and final example is my own company, Catch a Fire. So, Catch a Fire's platform um, makes it really easy for social good organizations to access professional services that they otherwise would never be able to afford. And the type of professional services I'm talking about are marketing help, design, technology, social media, um, um, video, um, um, did I mention technology? Um, <laughs> communication, PR, um, accounting, finance, um, basically any professional service that any type of company needs, um, which also means that nonprofits and social good organizations need these professional services in order to build their businesses. Um, and we're making it really easy then also for the professional on the other side to be able to access pro bono opportunities. So to, for the first time, really find a way to give your specific skill set to an organization in a really well-structured way. So like in eHarmony, um, we, um, when you, as a professional, when you come to Catch a Fire, you provide us with your profile information. So we use the LinkedIn API, we grab your resume data, you tell us what causes you're interested in, um, then we know who you are. Then we're pushing to you pro bono opportunities that match who you are. So say you're a designer and you care about education and environment. We're pushing to you projects that require your design skills with organizations who serve the causes of education and environment. So then now you're having, you know, it's easy for you to see these types of opportunities and then you simply apply um, and then you get matched to the organization that you're really passionate about. So the problem that we're solving is that 95% of nonprofits cannot access pro bono services. This is a pretty amazing statistic that came out from Deloitte in 2009. Um, what this means to me and what it means is that 95% of nonprofits cannot access professional services because they just simply cannot afford it. Um, the, and the statistic to back this up, the, the, the point that organizations cannot afford it is that the majority of nonprofits, as in 75% of all of the nonprofits in the United States, and depending on what source you're looking at, you know, from 1.5 million nonprofits to 2 million nonprofits in the United States, 75% of them operate under less than $500,000 in annual operating budget. With $500,000 in annual operating budget, it's pretty darn hard to afford any professional services when you have staff people to pay and when you actually have programs to service. Um, and so, you know, this is a, clearly a, a big problem. On the other side of our marketplace, there are tens of millions of talented individuals um, that don't know where to go um, in order to give their skills. So for me, um, after I graduated college, I went into investment banking um, and I tried to volunteer my financial skills, these newly minted financial skills. Um, and I searched every day for six months online. I called organizations and I couldn't find anything that fit my busy schedule or that was utilizing you know, the specific skills that I was gaining. Um, and that was not only frustrating, but it was really depressing. Um, it's really depressing to want to do good and then not be able to do it. I ended up quitting banking and I went into microfinance um, where I helped to start up a nonprofit um, in New York called BRAC USA, um, where BRAC USA um, is the US foundation of the bigger BRAC. Um, and how many of you know BRAC? Awesome. Well, BRAC um, is, in my opinion, the best kept secret in nonprofit. It's the largest nonprofit in the world headquartered out of Bangladesh, started in 1972 by an amazing man named Fazal Abed. It's a poverty alleviation organization that serves 140 million people. 
and has an annual operating budget of nearly $800 million annually. Um, and 80% of that budget comes from its own social enterprises. So needless to say, um, it's a very powerful, um, very impactful organization. And I was very lucky to help start up um, BRAC in the USA, the, the foundation to help BRAC's growth throughout Africa. So BRAC started to um, open programs um, in East Africa in 2006, and they needed to tap the US donor market, which they'd never had before in their you know, 30 years of history, which is why most of you haven't heard of BRAC. Um, and um, you know, we were starting this organization from the ground up. It was me and the president and CEO. I came on board as an intern, um, and she was a volunteer at the time, so we weren't paying ourselves anything, and we had to build quickly. And out of necessity, I just started to contact my friends who are professionals in you know, private equity, in marketing, um, in strategy consulting. And I put them on real projects that I needed to get done. So for instance, Monica at AOL helped with our marketing plan, and Scott helped with you know, the strategic plan. And I put nine of my friends on nine short-term, discrete pro bono projects for me. Um, and that was effective not only because we got that shit done, but because it freed up my time and Susan's time, the only two full-time people at this organization, to focus on what was what we called critical path items, which was fundraising and building these new programs. Um, and this pro bono strategy was very effective in nine months with nine pro bono professionals and two full-time staff. Um, Susan and I were able to raise $40 million for the organization. Um, so my lesson from this wasn't that you know every organization can raise $40 million in nine months, but that um, every organization can use pro bono if they're using it in a smart way. They can use it to build capacity for their organization so that their full-time staff people um, now are freed up to focus on what's critical path and they can get access to this, you know, the necessary professional services they need to um, move forward. Um, but anyway, back to motivation. Um, so how did we go about thinking about solving this problem, which is that, you know, Catch a Fire started, or I started thinking about Catch a Fire and putting um, my ideas on paper in 2009. Um, and in 2009, you still had this problem that 95% of nonprofits cannot access pro bono, and tens of millions of professionals are not connecting to pro bono opportunities. Why is this the case when there are volunteer matching players that are awesome? There's volunteer match that exists, there's idealists that exists, there's taproot that exists, there is a bunch. Um, but why? wasn't pro bono being addressed at scale. Well, um, we started thinking about motivations. Um, and what we wanted to figure out was how to get the organization to really care about providing the professional with a really high quality and meaningful opportunity. Because we knew that if we were able to provide professionals with great opportunities, um, not only would the work product be great, which means that the organization would benefit, but we would be able to unlock a lot more talent who would do this because they're receiving amazing experiences that are meaningful and impactful. So how do you get the organization to care? How do you get the organization to care when, I'm sorry, I skipped an important stat, um, when 60% of people who volunteer this year will never volunteer again next year? Um, and the volunteer rate in America um, this year is 27, or last year was 27%. So 60% of that 27% will never volunteer again. And I think that the main reason for that is because people have bad experiences. And if you have a bad experience, you're not going to do it again. Um, so how do you create good experiences? Well, we know this point, that people in organizations value what they pay for. So why not charge the organization a small fee to access our talent? Not a fee that is a barrier to entry, because our mission is to make it possible for every social good organization to access high quality professional services at a rate that they can afford, but just the psychology of you know, paying so that you have skin in the game and so that you're serious before you take on you know, one of you who you know, works a full-time job, who um, has built up your talents over years, um, and simply, you know, does not want their time wasted. And in fact, professionals donate more than they volunteer. Um, so what Catch a Fire did was we 
charge, we started charging organizations in order for them to have the skin in the game. Um, and this was, you know, this is an interesting story in and of itself and it's a different topic, but to actually think about how do you think about pricing something or charging something that has never been priced before, um, you know, that's just a, a really interesting business challenge. But um, some of the things that we learned was that, um, um, you know, when we first started charging, we just we charged, you know, a really minimal amount. We charged fifty dollars for every project, and um, Catch a Fire um, um, makes it easy for organizations to access professional services by templatizing projects. Um, so, for instance, every Catch a Fire project is characterized by three things: one, it's short term, meaning that on average it's thirty to fifty hours of a professional's time over two to three months, and it's discrete, meaning that there is a tangible and clear deliverable that is discrete like a social media plan or a Salesforce database customization or a logo design or a copywriting project or um, a motion graphics video or accounting systems advice. Whatever it is, we've templatized common nonprofit needs into nearly 50 different projects. Um, and so organizations now are paying us for access to membership to access these projects that have been structured so that the organization knows exactly what they're getting and you as in the professional know exactly what they're giving. Um, know exactly what you're giving. What's important about not only the fact that we charge the organization is that it, it actually is incentivizing them to be serious, which means that at the end of the day, they're going to get a better work product, right? But for you as a professional, what it does, it means that you're, you're, you have more faith in Catch Fire, in volunteering through Catch Fire, because you're being matched with an organization who has not only invested in this, invested in you, but is being trained. So we also train our organizations, meaning that every new member organization um, is required to do a three-hour training with us in the best practices of pro bono management. Um, and we also train the professional. Um, so in this way, we're trying to create really high quality professional experiences. Um, but then on the other side is, um, how do you motivate somebody to give 30 to 50 hours of their time pro bono? It's a pretty significant request. Um, and that's, you know, that's the challenge for us to figure out as we scale. Um, and so some of the things that we think about um, are you know, that people are motivated by professional development. People are motivated to build their resume. People are motivated to do pro bono in order to see the nonprofit sector to change industries. Um, they're motivated to network. They're motivated to find friends. They're motivated um, to make a difference. Um, and so we're thinking about that as we're serving the, the professional on the other side. So again, in conclusion, um, motivation is a means to an end and not the end itself. And it's really important for um, anyone who's building anything, particularly social good, that we think about how to motivate and incentivize the, the behavior we want to see and not just assume that we can do good just by the sheer fact that we want to. Thank you. Um, yeah, pro bono strategy. So um, it, it was very critical, meaning that um, we were building an organization from scratch. I came on board before the organization even had 501c3 status, so there was a lot to do. Um, in, and in order to get that done, we outsourced um, a lot of the critical work that we needed to do to pro bono professionals. So again, the marketing work, the strategy consulting work, the accounting work, um, the PR work, some of the website design work, and that allowed me and the president and CEO, the two full-time staff people, to focus on fundraising. Um, if you imagine um, two people trying to do the, the work that nine people did and fundraise at the same time, it would be impossible. So my point is that... <laughs> who gave us the money? Foundations, individuals, the same as many non the same, the same sources that that organizations raise money from. Foundations and individuals. Oh, the question. Sure. The question is, how did you raise forty million dollars?
That's a great question. So um, the site um, that is live right now um, um, has been live for a year, and in that time we've registered nearly 10,000 professionals um, and nearly 2,000 organizations. Um, and that's just the beginning um, because the past year we've actually been focused in operating only in New York City, where um, the, that's our headquarters, um, but Boston um, is actually has been our first city outside of New York. So we opened um, to serve Boston organizations um, last month where um, Design Museum um, of Boston um, is one of our founding members, um, and so we're you know now serving Boston organizations and of course Boston professionals. Yes. So how much of the work is done like remotely, the volunteering remotely versus? Like, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. The question is um, how much is done remotely. The, this platform, again, because our mission is to scale pro bono, um, is intended for um, the, the work to be able to be done remotely. So the majority of work is done remotely, even if you're receiving a match that is local, meaning that you might be matched to an organization in Boston, and that's a local match. So you have the benefit of meeting in person. However, most of the work is done virtually. Um, and that's important because we're designing projects and we're designing these pro bono projects for the busy professional who will do it after hours or on weekends um, and needs to have the flexibility of working remotely and virtually. Yeah. I'm just wondering for uh, organizations that are interested in taking uh, advantage of your services, what the process of becoming, um, becoming affiliated with, with the program is and you were talking about fee structures what those are currently. Sure, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, so the question is, um, how do organizations get involved with Catch a Fire? Um, well, you register on our site, um, and then one of our service officers gives you a call, and this is a 30-minute call for us to get to know you and you to get to know us because we vet our organizations. Um, and. Um, and then, you know, if if it makes sense for both parties, um, they the organization pays a membership fee on a sliding scale. So smaller organizations pay less, larger organizations pay more, and that sliding scale depending again on the number of projects. So we have three project package and we have a five project package, but it ranges from about and and the pricing, you know, changes based on you know some of the promotions that we're doing. But it ranges from two thousand dollars to five thousand dollars for three to five projects. Project. So the idea is for every dollar that um, your organization invests in Catch a Fire, you receive at least a 10x return. Yes? How do you match various political um, tendencies or even religious tendencies with between the nonprofits and the volunteers? Um, that's a great question. So um, the way that the matching platform works is, again, I, I always use the analogy to like a dating site because you get choice, right? So um, when you're on a dating site, you are pushed people who you think look good or <laughs> have, you know, like the personality based on what they write that you think you'd like. Um, and then you um, have the choice to um, ping them or contact them before you go out on your date. The same thing here. We first give the professional choice, meaning that we provide you with matches that are tailored to who you are, and then you apply to the projects that you think that you'd like to do. Um, and then the organization on the other side sees this application, sees a profile, and then se selects from that, from that, you know, whether or not they want to work with that applicant. So in that sense, you're, you know, to answer your question directly, um, we're, we're matching first um, on people's cause, interests, and skill sets, but then they're also having choice in whether or not they, they want to work together. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. The projects you serve, is there a range of duration or range of, of value? Is it like two weeks or, or one or four months? Um, yes, yeah, so the question is how are the projects structured? So um, projects are generally 30 to 50 hours of a professional's time over two to three months, and that every project has a very clear and discreet deliverable. Um, and all of this is transparent, so the organization is coming to the Catch a Fire website and can look at what is called the project menu to see the list of projects that they are interested in that will address certain needs.
So, and then, you know, the value of the project, of what you would pay for that project in the marketplace is on the project template, the number of hours, the actual description, the deliverable, um, the scope of work, the number, average number of meetings, organization prerequisites, professional prerequisites, all of that is outlined in the project template. If a project requires multiple different talents, you also um, so our projects, again, are discrete, um, meaning that there generally aren't multiple talents. And so we're organizing them in terms of like industry area. So for instance, um, with marketing, you have projects like Google AdWords plan or um, search engine optimization or online marketing plan on a shoestring budget. So we're really looking at um, matching people with their specific your specialized skill set for a specific project. Yes? I don't recall you mentioning this, but there are other tasks that are not benefits that are important That would be lovely, um, but um, no. So people who volunteer do not get tax benefits. Um, and that's something that hopefully one day Catch Fire will have the ability to advocate for. Um, Um, well, that's just the U.S. tax law. That probably doesn't make much sense. Yes? When you're trying to get the word out about Catch Fire for professionals and also organizations, um, that's a great question. What are we doing to get the word out? So as I mentioned, um, you know, we've been in New York today and actually most of our growth has been organic. Um, so what's interesting on the, you know, social good organization side or the nonprofit side is that the nonprofit is generally quite well networked. Um, so when, you know, organizations hear about us and they use our service and they have a great experience, they're telling their friends. Um, on the professional side, it's the same thing, um, but we are using social media to some extent to get the word out. But now that we've really proved this model and it's working well. We've made nearly 600 matches. Um, we do something called the Net Promo Promoter Score to um, to measure happiness. We have you know off the chart Net Promoter Score of over nine. Um, now we're investing in how to get the word out. So we're building a new website um, and we're creating um, the necessary viral loops in this website. Um, and we're going to be expanding all over the country. So. Um, um, that's something that is now um, the focus, is how to get the word out so we get as many professionals to volunteer and as many organizations to be able to benefit. Yes? Um, that's a great question. Um, so. Um, yes, so we, we built this project menu, um, and actually, let me show you it. Mm, it's hard. Can you see that better? Um, so basically this, okay, great. So, so we built this project menu with nearly 50 different projects based on understanding organizational needs. So what we did is we went out back in 2009 and interviewed hundreds of social good organizations and asked them the simple question, what are your skills-based needs? And then built and cre did the legwork essentially and created project templates based on their needs. So we started off with eight projects and those projects um, in the beginning were the most common want, common needs and those were in marketing, PR, communications and design. So those were the most popular um, and then we started building it out. So now we're serving, you know, and, and, um, and uh, providing services to organizations across many different needs. However, it always changes um, in terms of what is what is requested more. So um, you can see in our project menu, some of our projects are waitlisted. So website design project is waitlisted, meaning that there are a lot of organizations that have requested this project, and we need more professionals to volunteer to do it. Um, so the answer is that it, it it always shifts, and until we get to liquidity liquidity in the marketplace, where you know it works, where like Amazon has liquidity, it just like <coughs> naturally balances itself out. We'll always be doing the legwork of you know figuring out you know how to get more professionals in one specific area, or how to get organizations to request projects 
or incentivize them to see that they do need X type of project so that all of these types of professionals with those skills can give them. So it's a, that's an interesting business challenge. Yes? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. So when you're qualifying organizations and speaking with them, is there a process to actually define who's in need of the pro bono work versus who's trying to just cut, you know, cut costs and cut positions and kind of downsize and utilize services to maybe stay afloat whereas there are actually organizations who are in need? That's an interesting question. Um, I gen we generally have never seen that, meaning that organizations, even, I mean, I think the point is that even organizations who are trying to cut costs, in my opinion, that's a good thing, right? Like, it, and it doesn't mean they're cu cutting, like, full-time staff people. In fact, we, we never see that happen. But, you know, organizations, especially in this economy, do need to cut costs. And to cut costs is a good thing because it, it means that they're serving more of their beneficiaries. So if they're able to utilize resources more efficiently and effectively by using pro bono, say, instead of, you know, paying um, for a designer at market rates, now they can come to Catch a Fire and pay for it at, you know, 5% of the cost. Why shouldn't they? Especially if they're a social good organization. Um, but the way that we vet is that um, we have this phone call and every one of our service officers applies the screen if I was a professional would I want to give 30 to 50 hours of my time to this organization so you know it's not a checklist it's not an application but I think that personal screen of would I want to give my time and skills to this organization do I believe that this organization has a compelling um, and um, social mission that I trust is the volunteer manager or the executive director or whoever I'm speaking on the phone with somebody that you know I think um, I would want to work with all of those things play into how we choose whether or not we want to work with the organization but um, the point of you know organizations trying to to cut costs and, and be more efficient is the entire point of catch a fire we believe that organizations need to be more efficient and cost-effective yes That's a great question. Um, so the way we think about success um, on the professional side um, is that it, in multiple ways. One, they come back um, and use Catch a Fire again. Of course, that you know is a good indication of uh, the fact that we provided them with a good experience. Um, but we also encourage both the professional and the organization, organization especially, to think about being matched to this professional as an opportunity to gain a lifelong advocate. So if the, again, to the point that we're trying to create high quality experiences, if we're educating the organization to create a really amazing experience for this professional, and we're saying if you do this, this professional professional will most likely, after their Catch a Fire project, after that three months, they'll probably tell their friends about you, they might serve on your board, they might donate to you, they will certainly be a good ambassador um, forever. Um, that's a really great to us indication that the project has been a success if the professional stays on and supports the organization. Um, anecdotally. But we also do ratings and reviews. So at the end of every project, we do um, ratings and reviews, meaning that the organization rates and reviews a volunteer, the volunteer rates and reviews the organization. They both rate and review Catch a Fire. Um, so we're collecting that information. Um, right now, ratings and reviews on organizations and volunteers are not public. Um, as you can imagine, they're very tricky. But um, we're thinking with you know the new site that we'll be launching next year, thinking about how to, for instance, um, indicate that a professional is a really great professional because they have, you know, by badges or whatnot, um, they've done, you know, X number of projects and done it really well, or an organization has used, you know, 11 volunteers and have, and have had great, you know, ratings and reviews. So this concept, again, of incentivizing the right behavior um, will come into play. 
Yes. Now, the clients, um, you mentioned several so good companies that can be on the spectrum of for profit to non profit. Yes. Who can you know, post projects here? Um, so, any social mission organization. So, um, not, you know, we don't believe that 501c3s are the only organizations that do good. Um, you know, we are in, I guess, in a time where new types of organizations are emerging and the for-profit social mission business, I think, um, is as able to create um, as much social, social good as a nonprofit. So again, it's the screening process of that service officer being on the phone and really being compelled by you know the organization's social mission. So we're serving a lot of great startup social enterprises, um, and you know, and regular social enterprises as well, and several in Boston as well. So we have a great group of um, Boston organizations, from the big ones like Pine Street Inn and City Year, um, and Year Up to smaller ones like Design Museum um, Boston. Um, Art Venue, um, which was a Mass Challenge winner, um, um, We Go Wise, and there's a great and a, a wide breadth of organizations um, that are using Catch a Fire. Is there anybody in the government using it? Any government using it? That's a great question. Um, I don't think that any government um, agencies or institutions are using Catch a Fire. However, we have charter schools um, and yeah, that's about it. One more question? Yes. Um, do, have you had any, like, you know, if like our whole agency wanted to donate, you know, collectively services with that? I mean, do, do you have yes. That's a great question. So companies are coming to us um, in order for their employees to access pro bono opportunities. For instance, Google um, in New York is interested in having their employees, you know, access pro bono opportunities so they can give their skills, not just go build a house. Um, and so we are starting to um, serve companies, agencies selectively based on how ready they are for it um, because as you can imagine um, working with companies does take quite some time. But you know if the if the company has intent and the the you know people are um, bought in from senior management level to like you know the grassroots um, it's easy to plug and play we'll certainly serve um, companies <laughs>